Merciful to me, Lord, for I am in distress. My eyes grow weak with sorrow, my soul and body with grief. My life is consumed by anguish and my years by groaning. My strength fails because of my affliction and my bones grow weak. Because of all my enemies, I am the utter contempt of my neighbors and an object of dread to my closest friends. Those who see me on the street flee from me. I am forgotten as though I were dead. I have become like broken pottery, for I hear many whispering, terror on every side. They conspire against me and plot to take my life. But I trust in you, Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. Deliver me from the hands of my enemies, from those who pursue me. Let your face shine on your servant. Save me in your unfailing love. God of mercy, we confess that in times of trouble, we easily doubt your goodness. Overwhelming suffering and tragedy lead us to question your care and attentiveness. We think, surely you would intervene. We may even be persuaded to conclude that your promises do not hold true or that you are not love. But we today, in contemplating the passion of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, recognize your coming to us in all suffering and tragedy, that rather than being distant or aloof, you meet us where we hurt and doubt. May we be astounded that you have entered willingly into our misery to be with us, even if not to explain why things happen as they do. May your presence satisfy the need of our soul, even if we have no answers to satisfy the questions in our minds. Be with us, Lord. 
hear the cries of all who suffer and are afraid. May we, like the psalmist, pour out our sorrow and fear to you. We lament and grieve for the whole world and beg for your mercy as our hope. Grant us strength beyond ourselves, faith to combat our fears, and hope in your love. This we ask through Christ, who suffered for us and with us. Amen. The Sovereign Lord has given me a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being instructed. The Sovereign Lord has opened my ears. I have not been rebellious. I have not turned away. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Because the Sovereign Lord helped me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore have I set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. The word of the Lord.
kiddos, it's me, Rachel. Let's see, who's out there? Do I see Hannah and Peter? And is that Angeline and maybe baby Eleanor? Who else is out there? Everybody say your name right now. Oh, I'm glad that you and I are here together doing church online. Right now what I'm doing, which I do a lot of in this time of year, is I'm weeding in my garden. I'm pulling out the stuff that we don't want to grow to make space for the stuff that I do want to grow, like flowers. So the thing about weeding is I have to keep doing it. I'll get a weed like this. I don't want this to grow in my garden and I'll pull it out. But you know what? I pulled out one just like that last year and there's a good chance I'll pull it out again next year. So why do I keep weeding? Well, I really want the good stuff to keep growing. And if I want the good stuff to keep growing, I have to keep working on getting rid of these weeds. It's kind of like our own lives. Do you have plants growing in your heart? No. But if you're like me, you have some stuff growing in your heart that you might not want to have growing there. Like maybe sometimes you want to tell lies or you don't want to share your toys or you're not nice to someone that you love. That's all stuff in our life that we got to get rid of. That's like weeds in our life. And we want to make space for good stuff to grow. Stuff like love and joy and kindness. So how do we pull out the weeds in our life? It's not like you can do it with a shovel. Well, there's two things you can do. And the first one is you can ask for God's help. You can just keep saying prayers, asking God to help you to get rid of the things that you don't want in your life. And the other thing is, once you've asked for God's help, you can stop and think. There's usually a second right before you do something wrong where you know that it's wrong and you can decide, should I do this bad thing anyway? Or should I pull that weed out and try and do better? And that's when God's help really, really is helpful for you. Why don't we say a little prayer together? God, thank you for growing the good things in our hearts. Please help us to see the weeds when they're coming up, the things that we don't want to do that we know are wrong. And please help us to get rid of those weeds. We know we'll have to keep doing it over and over but we also know that we really want to grow love like your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.
Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he made no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor wondered greatly. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much over him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the people to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this righteous man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus in the, into the praetorium, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe upon him, and plaiting a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spat upon him, and they took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him, and led him away to crucify him. As they were marching out, they came upon a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. This man they compelled to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink, mingled with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots, and they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you're the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and will believe in him. He trusts God. Let God deliver him now, if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of the bystanders, hearing it, said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with vinegar, and put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let's see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs were also opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquakes and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God, the Word of the Lord. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, 
did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The Word of the Lord. Today is Palm Sunday, but we're not following the readings dealing with uh, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Uh, in the lectionary, we are given two options for this Sunday, whether to follow the liturgy of the palms and read about Jesus' triumphal entry and, and think about him being proclaimed as the king coming into Jerusalem, or we are also given the option of reading the scriptures having to deal with his death, with his crucifixion, and follow what is called the Liturgy of the Passion. And so I've chosen for us to follow the Liturgy of the Passion this morning and to think about the death of Jesus. And the reason I want us to think about it is, is because we often have uh, questions about why. We wonder why things happen as they do. We can ask that about uh, Jesus' death. Why does Jesus have to die? But certainly with what's going on in our world right now, those questions are being asked. They naturally come to our minds. Well, why is this happening? Why is this coronavirus infecting so many people and causing so many deaths and so much suffering? Uh, why is it ha happening this way? And then we might start to wonder, well, why does God allow this to happen? Or we might think, well, why, why did God create a, a world where even this can happen? Why didn't God just create a world where... Uh, viruses don't exist. Uh, why didn't God create a world where we are not mortal and we don't die? Well, we don't always have answers, not in Scripture, to some of our questions that we can ask like that. We can ask those questions all we want, but Scripture doesn't, doesn't offer us answers. But it does say to us that, in fact, God has created a world where we are not mortal and viruses do not cause sickness and death. And scripture says, but we're not at that world. We're not in that world yet. We've not arrived. That would be the new heavens and new earth. That would be what we would call heaven itself. That would be the new Jerusalem. That would be what the Hebrew writer referred to as there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. It's, it's the, the garden again, the parad being in paradise. You can find a lot of images and all those images, whether it's the, the land of Canaan, the land of promise, all the images speak to us of we're on a journey to a wonderful place that God has prepared, but we haven't arrived yet. And so for a reason that scripture does not completely explain to us, it remains a mystery. We deal with life as we experience it now. And there is trouble and tragedy um, you know, why did God create a world where people can sin? Why didn't he just make us so that we wouldn't do wrong? Um, all those questions can be asked, but we don't always have good answers. One, one question I've always encouraged us that we can ask and find an answer to is the question, well, what can I learn? No matter what's going on, no matter uh, what I'm experiencing, uh, I can always ask the question, well, what can I learn in this situation? It doesn't mean God is, is creating the situation in order to teach me. It simply means there is still something I can learn about myself and about God and about faithfulness and about how to live. So if I ask the question, well, why did God create me so that I would make, uh, had the capacity to make mistakes and do sinful things? I don't know why God has given me um, that freedom. But I can ask the question, what can I learn given the fact that I do have the ability to make choices and sometimes I make poor choices? What, do I, what can I learn? One of the things I can certainly learn is I need to depend on God. I need to learn to be obedient given the fact that I often don't know how to live and what to do. So the why questions about why things are as they are often there are no answers. But the question about what can I learn, we can often find an answer for that.
But I want us to explore a little bit more uh, the why questions with respect to uh, the death of Jesus, his crucifixion. Because it's a similar question that we might be asking about what's going on today. And by looking at how we approach that, the question about Jesus' death might help us think about how to approach uh, the questions that arise about what's going on in our world today. Often we ask the question, why did Jesus have to die? And I think a better question, the, the one that scripture will actually answer for us, is why did Jesus die? If we take out the two words, have to, as if we're trying to find some sort of uh, mystery in, in the plan and will of God or what God knew or didn't know or what God wanted to happen or not happen, um, I'm often able not to figure that out. But what scripture clearly does tell me is, is some ways of understanding why Jesus died. And I want to explore that in, in two respects. One is what caused his death, and the second is what happened as a result of his death. And those are both ways in which we, which scripture talks about why Jesus died, why he died in, in the respect of what caused his death, but why he died in order to accomplish what? What was accomplished? So that's what I want us to think about this morning. Kind of the very first reason that we can um, say why Jesus died, it's, it's what Paul was talking about in Philippians, because he became a man. When the Son of God became the man Jesus, uh, men are mortal. Human beings are mortal. We live and then we die. And so once the Son of God, the Word, the eternal Word, became a human being, the man Jesus, he was going to die. Now that doesn't answer the question as to, well, why did he die the, the way he died? But he was, he was going to die. That's why he became a human being, to, to be with us and to share in our sufferings and in our struggles. And to, to rather than to be distant and, and aloof and somehow far away and, and uninvolved, he chose to be right in the middle of it with us to show us his great care and concern. And so Jesus died because he was a man. But there's a, another obvious reason, is that some leaders of his day uh, conspired to kill him. Um, and it's, it's kind of a historical, obvious reason. Uh, the Jewish uh, religious leaders uh, were fearful of him. Um, they believed he was uh, leading people astray. And they believed he was a threat to Israel. As uh, the, the Gospel of John tells us about the conversations that happened in the Sanhedrin, uh, probably relayed uh, by Nicodemus back to the disciples, because he was a member of that group. That's how they ended up being privy to those conversations. But the conversation that happened uh, among those Jewish leaders was they were afraid. They were not only jealous of Jesus's uh, popularity, but they were afraid that he was going to start a revolt that he was going to uh, you know, inspire the people to, to rise up against the Romans, and they were practical enough to know we will never win a battle against the Romans. And so they came to the conclusion, a very pragmatic one, it's better that we kill one man than we lose the whole country and our place, of course, their, their status. But in a paradoxical way, they are sacrificing Jesus for the sake of saving Israel, which ironically is what is going to happen, that Jesus is going to save not only Israel, but the whole world through his death. But of course, they're trying to sacrifice him in a different way, thinking it's better we just kill one man and therefore preserve our position and our country than let him start a revolution that may cost us all everything we know and hold dear. And so that's part of the, the reason why he died, is these leaders conspired against him. It certainly wasn't all the Jewish people. The common people seemed to adore him and love him, and they're the ones who cheered when he came into the city. It was a smaller group of leaders whose power was threatened by what he was doing and saying, and who were fearful. They're the ones who conspired to kill him. But the Romans also had a part in that. I mean, Pilate, despite the fact that he washes his hands, 
and, and declares himself innocent, I'm sorry, Pilate, that doesn't make you innocent. Uh, you knew the man was, was innocent of what he was being accused of. You knew that they, out of jealousy, were putting him forward and, and asking for his execution. So you can't simply wash your hands and absolve yourself. He had his own interests. He was the governor, and it was his job to maintain the peace. And the last thing he wanted was some trouble in Jerusalem over this man. And so he chooses to go ahead and have Jesus be executed so as to bring about peace. And isn't that ironic as well? Because Jesus' death does bring peace, but not in the way that Pilate was thinking. And so those leaders together, both a Roman governor and the Jewish religious leaders conspired to kill Jesus. And that's one of the reasons why he died. He died because he was a man. And he died because some people conspired to kill him. But the Apostle John tells us another reason, kind of a broader reason. Uh, in John chapter 3, verse 19, the Apostle John says, And this is the judgment. Now, he doesn't mean a judgment like a, a judge would pass sentence. He means judgment in the sense of this is a statement of what is true. This is a clarification of reality. So the, the true statement about things is as follows. That the light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. When we're thinking about the death of Jesus and we're wondering, well, why did Jesus die? Well, John says... He was the light, and yet people love darkness rather than light. And that's true of us. It's not just true of the Jewish leaders and Pilate who conspired to kill him. It's true of all of humanity, that the light of God appeared among us. And yet we all have always loved darkness. Now, it's not that we love darkness because we knew the light to be light and preferred the darkness. I think the love of darkness is true because often we didn't know what the light was. It didn't appear to be light to us. All we knew was darkness, and we loved what we knew more than something strange, different, and new, not yet recognizing it to be light. So when when this is true of us, when we realize it's true of us, it's basically saying, even when we are shown the righteousness, goodness of God, the light of God, we don't automatically recognize it as such. Often we resist it initially, not realizing that this is truly good and better for us. And we're more familiar with what we've been doing, and we don't realize what we're doing is really this metaphorical darkness. But it's what we're familiar with. It's what we, we automatically gravitate toward. So when John says, because their deeds were evil, I think he means because the deeds we do and the ones we know are the ones that are the corrupt things. And it really takes God's grace and patience working to show us the light, to be the light within, to shine within us the light of his glory. And that takes time. And so John's saying, yes, Jesus was the light that came into the world, but the problem is all of us are unfamiliar with that light of God, and so we, we do not gravitate toward it. So as John began in his gospel in the first chapter, he said, he came into his own, but his own did not receive him. It's not because they recognized him to be the creator who had come among them as Emmanuel, God with us, because they were unfamiliar with the presence of God. And so they did not receive him. That So many reject him because we do not know the light. And so that's a further reason, one that we realize involves us, that each and every time we have either out of ignorance chosen what is not righteous or even knowingly chosen what is not righteous because of some short-term desire for pleasure or to satisfy our own needs, we've embraced darkness rather than light. And so to that degree, all of us have rejected Christ at some point. The rejection that is so perfectly expressed in his crucifixion. But it's a rejection that we've all participated in. And so it's just part of why Jesus died. It's because we have trouble accepting God. 
But there's kind of a fourth reason I think about is uh, that's revealed in Scripture, is that uh, the forces of evil, the spiritual forces, that Satan was conspiring to put Jesus to death. And we have the, the scripture that talks about Satan entering into Judas and, and uh, you know, inspiring him to betray Jesus. And now, not apart from J Judas's own uh, willingness to, to do things for his own selfish, selfish advantage. I mean, that's uh, even stated in the gospel that though he often carried the money bag, he would dip into it himself and help himself from it. So he already had an inclination to do things that were self-serving. And but but part of what Scripture tells us is that uh, the devil himself was was trying to destroy Jesus, like he tried to destroy him through the temptations in the wilderness. That unable to do that, Satan finally was thinking, "If I can kill him, that will be it." Of course, uh, the way Scripture uh, reveals it is the grave can't hold Jesus, death cannot constrain him, and so. Though Satan conspires to kill Jesus, it doesn't work. He's unable to hold Jesus. But, but that's another reason we could say why Jesus died. And I think there's a fifth. A fifth is um, what John says in John 3.16, that it's because of the love of God that Jesus died. I mean, yes, it's because some leaders conspired against him. Yes, it's because he was a mortal man. Yes, it's because all of us uh, are, are people who, who know darkness and therefore gravitate to it and, and we reject the light. It's because Satan was, was uh, conspiring, wanting to kill Jesus, thinking he could defeat the plans of God. But it's also because of the love of God. I mean, Jesus died because he was God who came into the world. And he came into the world specifically because of the love of God. And so in that sense, Jesus died because of the love of God for his creation, his desire to come to us in the midst of our need, even though we would not be willing to re accept him, even though that we would not even recognize him as light from God. And so that kind of bridges over for me into the other the other way I wanted to think about why he died is, well, what was accomplished? And there's several things that Scripture tells us that were accomplished because Jesus died. One is that Jesus defeated both sin and death. He defeats death by, by dying and then raising. And someone you know, might speculate kind of, well, why do it that way? Why not just banish death? Why just not declare death to be null and void? Let's just do away with death. St. Athanasius in his uh, work on the incarnation written back in the f early 400s uh, AD kind of took up that idea uh, and, and said, if, if God simply were to banish sin and death, declare it to be exiled, to be no longer part of the world. Someone might say he banished it because he could not defeat it. He banished sin and temptation because he couldn't withstand sin and temptation. He banished death because he exiled an enemy he was unable to defeat. You could say the same, well, why doesn't he just banish Satan? Well, rather than just exiling these enemies, Jesus faces them and defeats them. And that may not answer completely why God chose to become a human being and defeat death by dying and defeat sin by resisting it and uh, overcoming its effects, the, the spiritual death and separation of sin. It may not answer completely why God does things that way, but it does say those are the effects of Jesus' death that he truly defeats death by dying. He puts death to death, and he puts sin and its consequences to death, and he defeats Satan by letting Satan do his worst. In some ways, you could say Jesus takes on the worst that sin can give, all the hatred, all the evil of the world. He allows it to come upon him, and yet it does not overcome him. He overcomes it. He takes it in, and re returns instead grace and love, 
in his words, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. So he takes all the abuse, but he, he returns love. He does not transmit that eye for eye, tooth for tooth, but he takes on the sin of the world and yet offers forgiveness and grace. So the mystery that scripture is revealing is that this is how God has defeated these things that stand against us. But something else that we notice about what uh, is the effect of Jesus' death is something that Paul talks about in his letter to the Romans. He talks about Jesus becoming a kind of second Adam, a new Adam. If the first Adam, kind of the, the, the figurehead of, the, of humanity, of the human race, uh, sinned, well, Jesus has become a new uh, beginning of humanity a new do-over and restart of the human story. And he has become the righteous one so as to, in him, rewrite the human experience. So this is the sense in which we say that Jesus' righteous life and faithful death has now become the gift he offers us. So no longer is our human story simply the story of our own actions and our own deeds. But our human story can be what is his legacy, that we can stand in his faith and in his life and righteousness, that we can receive that by the grace of God, that Jesus has begun for us a new humanity to, into which we enter simply because we choose and desire to follow the call of God, to receive this gift to receive this as grace. And so there's that sense in which Jesus then is restarting the whole human story for all of us. And that was accomplished by his death. And I guess the, the final thing that I want to note about the death of Jesus this morning is that it most clearly communicates to us that God is with us in our suffering and in our hurt. That's really the, the point that Paul seems to be making. Jesus is God with us, but before God the Son became the man Jesus, he had the option to say, well, no, I'll just stay here in heaven. I don't think I want to go down there and join humanity and take on flesh, and humble myself. But that's the whole point Paul's making. Rather than staying in his divine state, um, far removed, as it were, from human suffering, instead of that, God says, no, I choose to join my creation and to suffer with them and for them. In fact, to suffer more than they suffer to take on the suffering of the whole world and to offer healing for that, forgiveness and grace. So particularly with what is going on in our world today, uh, an unbelievable amount of suffering and tragedy. What the cross tells us is that we know that God is with us and that he bears our pain and hurt. And there is nothing that hurts us that does not also hurt God. He is not a God devoid of emotion or passion uh, in, in, in that sense of feeling what we feel. In fact, I believe he feels it more intensely than we do. And so this is the God who has chosen not only to come as the man Jesus, but has chosen to be with his people always, even to the end of this age. And then at the end of this age, bring us into a new world. Of course, that's what we talk about next week at Easter. But let me close us with prayer. And may we think this week, during the week of Jesus' passion, about his suffering and the ways in which that communicates to us the love of God. Holy God, we thank you for your eternal love, which can bear us through even the most horrible and tragic of circumstances. Be with your people and let your people be the priests to the world 
who minister your grace and kindness and hope and goodness to others who don't perhaps yet know that hope. And may we share with them our confidence and may they be comforted. Give us your grace and we pray that you remove and lessen what is occurring and give us hope for the future. And this we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned against you in our thoughts, words, and deeds. We have had anxieties about the future, even though we proclaim you as Lord. We have failed to love our neighbors, and we have disobeyed your commands. Have mercy upon us, Lord Jesus. Forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness, that we may walk in your ways and serve you in grace and love. This we ask in your holy name. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Therefore, you are forgiven. You are cleansed of all unrighteousness, and you are worthy partake of this holy meal. The Lord be with you. And also, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is a right, good, proper, and joyful thing at all times and in all places to give you thanks, Lord God. We join our voices with the angels and archangels and all the company of heaven who have forever sing this song. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In the beginning, O Lord, you created us for yourself. But even though we have fallen through our disobedience to sin and death, you and your infinite mercy, grace, and love sent your only begotten Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to live among us as a man, born of a virgin. He suffered every hardship and adversity, every trial, trouble, tribulation, and temptation that we face, except without sin. Finally, he stretched out his arms upon the cross in perfect obedience to your will and offered himself as a sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. On the night on which our Lord Jesus was given over to suffering and death through the betrayal of a friend, he took bread and after he had blessed it and given thanks to you for it, O Lord, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. After the supper, he took the cup, and after he had blessed it and given thanks to you for it, O Lord, he said, Drink of this, all of you. This is my body of the new covenant, which is shed for the remission of your sins and the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as often as we eat this bread and drink of this cup, we eat the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. We proclaim his death until he comes again. Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ, Christ has died, Christ, Christ, Christ is risen, Christ, Christ, Christ will come again. Lord Holy Spirit, you are the giver of life in whom we live and move and have our being. Consecrate this bread and wine to be the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and consecrate us, O Lord partake of this holy meal. All this we ask, Lord Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the glory of his Father. Amen. Therefore, we pray the prayer our Lord taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ keep you unto eternal life. We thank you, Lord God, that you have fed us with these holy mysteries of the body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. By eating his body, we become members of his body and thus his agents in this world. Help us to be the distributors of your blessings, the agents of your providence, the instruments of your grace, and the ambassadors of your love to all the people we meet in our everyday lives. By drinking his blood, we have taken on his life, which was not finally pierced by the cross, nor smothered in the tomb, but lasts forevermore. We thank you for this, the medicine of immortality, the antidote to death. All this we pray in the most holy and precious name of Jesus Christ, because he is alive. He reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit. You are one God, now and forever. Amen. For your gifts, we give you thanks. For you, God of all, continue to love and care for us, bearing us through every hardship and trial, suffering for us and with us, in order to bring us to yourself. Give us courage and hope, strength and peace, to share, by grace, your goodness with everyone we meet. To you be all glory and praise, for you are one God, Father, Son, and Spirit, now and forever. Amen. 